Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is a, a talk for Lock of the Lives, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and this is Tony Wilson, um, who's a lecturer at the SRUC in Cooper. Um, he is very kindly offered um, to go for a walk with one of my colleagues, Amy, um, a couple of weeks ago through our woodland uh, on our reserve at Lock of the Lows. So we've got quite a lot of different types of fungi. I think one of the last forays that we did a couple of years ago, we got over 100 different types of fungi. So we know it's a really rich area. Um, but given all of the COVID regulations and the awkwardness that is getting very close to people, we decided that we'd, we'd try things a little bit differently this year. So um, between Tony and Amy, they've managed to pull together a fantastic presentation, which we've just taken the sound out of. Um, and Tony is basically going to talk over the top of it effectively. So if he says, if you hear him say, stop the video, Emma, it's because I'm the one that's controlling the video. Um, but um, yeah, well, we'll get started. Um, okay. Go for it. To the beginning. Yes. As Emma was saying, if you don't hear any sound from the video, um, that's not your fault. It's the video has had the, the audio taken off it. Uh, but you should be able to hear me talk over the top of it. So um, I went up to the reserve oh, about three weeks ago, something like that, and we had a little look around to see what we could find. Uh, so what we're going to do is look at the species in no particular order, um, but we're going to start off with one called an earth ball. And you can see here some of the footage that uh, Amy took of that particular species. Um, yeah, so earth balls, as the name suggests, are ball shaped, uh, roughly speaking. And they've usually got that sort of scaly top that you can see there. Uh, they're closely related to puffballs, which you've probably heard of, uh, which we couldn't find. Uh, what you're seeing in that image uh, to the top right, well, too late. <laughs> anyway, there's me sort of pointing out these uh, these mushrooms here. So, um, as I said, they're related to uh, puffballs. The major difference, which you'll see uh, shortly, is that the inside of them isn't white when the flesh is young. Uh, earth, earth balls have got a sort of black coloured inner layer uh, with a sort of marbled white effect. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any particularly fresh ones to show that. But the difference between earth ball and puff ball, uh, when you cut them in half, as I'm about to do, when they're young, uh, a puff ball looks like a fresh marshmallow. So it's pure white in the middle, similar sort of texture to a marshmallow. And the earth ball, as I said, is more of a sort of marbled black with sort of white marbling. And you can just about make that out a little bit. By this stage, um, what you've got around the outside is a, a sort of leathery bag uh, filled with a mixture of uh, spores and a cotton wool-like substance made up of some of the threads that create the fungal body. Uh, the idea is when, when the spores are ripe, the, this bag will rupture uh, and anything banging against it from a raindrop to uh, a squirrel to me squeezing it uh, allows the spores to puff out through the hole in the bag. And the network of threads, the cotton wool-like effect, um, what that does is sort of recharges the shape of the ball so it's ready for another uh, another puff. Now these are all from a group called the gastromycetes, which means stomach fungus. Uh, and you can see the idea behind that. Uh, if you imagine a haggis made from a sheep's stomach, uh, the contents of it in this instance would be the spores and, uh, and those networks of threads. Um, we seem to have paused for some reason. It's having trouble loading. Anyway, one thing I should point out is that um, earth balls are slightly poisonous, so it's a good idea to not mix them up with puff balls. Uh, and there's some that have started to discharge the spores. So with earth balls, they tend to rupture quite a lot at the top. They don't just make little holes; they sort of burst open like that. Um, like a lot of fungus, they'll form rings. 
And what you see here is a very stilted video of me walking around the ring, uh, pointing out individuals. Now, the reason that it's forming that ring is when two sexes of uh, the fungal network meet, uh, they meet somewhere around about where I'm standing in that ring and they produce a fertile uh, network that, that has all the genetic material needed for reproduction. Uh, and from that central point, a new network of threads grow out and at the leading edge of that, they produce uh, fruiting bodies. So what you have to remember is these fungi that we're seeing are just the fruiting bodies of that individual organism. Uh, they're a bit like, imagine an underground apple tree with just the uh, fruit showing above the surface. It's, it's kind of analogous to that. Uh, so there we go, we've got a few more of these earth balls showing up there. So like I say, they're, they're fruit bodies, their sole purpose is to spread spores around. Um, now, other organisms have got different ways of doing it, and I'll talk through a few of those. So moving on from the uh, earth balls that we found, what we have in front of me here that I was pointing at is a piece of dead wood. Uh, and as I say to my students, dead wood is dead good because it's uh, a host for all sorts of different types of organisms, including fungi. And once the video focuses, you might just about be able to see uh, a little black stalk with a little white tip on it. Any second, now, there you are. If you can just make that out slightly to the right of centre, uh, that's uh, a fungi called a candle snuff. Uh, so-called because it's supposed to look like the wick of a candle that's been snuffed out. Uh, so imagine the, the black bit at the bottom is the candle wick and the white at the top is sort of like the ash. And that uh, particular type of fungi, along with lots of them, is absorbing nutrients from that dead log. Uh, the network of threads that is the actual fungal body is penetrating through that network of wood. Um, and it's decomposing it, it's breaking down the woody tissue. Uh, fungi are one of the few organisms that can do that. It's absorbing nutrients for its own use, and then when it's ready to reproduce, it will produce these uh, fertile bodies that we call mushrooms, toadstools, fungi. Um, so those bodies will release spores when they're ripe, when the conditions are right. Um, and this is a close relative of that uh, candle snuff. This is called dead man's fingers because a good specimen looks like a sort of blackened stalk. I uh, imagine somebody's been buried in the ground for a long time and the, all that's left is the black fingers sticking out of the... <laughs> uh, but inside, when you cut them in half, you can see the pure white in the centre um, and all the spore releasing parts are kind of scattered around the edge of the, of the fruit body. Uh, we found actually quite a lot of these particular fungi. This is called a white uh, helvella. Uh, so in, I think the New English name is the white saddle because the top of the cap looks a little bit like a saddle. There you go. Okay. Uh, so like the last couple, these are from a group called the ascomycetes. Um, and they do, they do spore release slightly different from most of the fungi you'll be familiar with. In fact, maybe Emma, if you could pause it a second, I'll just fire up that slide that I had ready. Uh, so bear with me, everyone. I've got a, uh, hopefully, hopefully this is going to work. I've got a slide to show kind of what I'm talking about. If I can find the damn thing, here we go. Right. Okay, so let's get my mouse working. Sorry, folks. Uh, can we see that? Right, so uh, what you have on the left is one of these ascomycete fungi, and on the right, a, a basidiomycete. Now, those are just technical terms. Don't get too hung up on them. Uh, but the major difference is, for instance, that white saddle. Um, you see where it says fertile hymenium? Uh, that's where the spores are produced. So they're all uh, arranged along the outside edge of the cap structure. Okay, and they fire the spores out through pores on that surface. 
whereas on the right hand image uh, these are the, the fungi that you probably more familiar with from supermarkets and so on they have gill like structures underneath the cap um, and the spores are contained within those gill like structures so when they're released they have to drop down due to gravity and then blow about in the wind whereas the ascomycetes they shoot them out. One of the other names of that group is the spore shooters. So they'll fire the spores out of the little pores you can maybe just about make out in the fertile hymenium bit there. I don't know if my cursor's showing up, but anyway. Okay, so let's restart the video. Are we ready to restart? Is it going to go horribly wrong? <laughs> Okay, so white saddles uh, are from a group called the Helvellas. Um, there's a whole range of them. They're pretty tricky to identify some of them. You need to have specialist equipment like microscopes, uh, sometimes chemicals. And as I was saying to Emma earlier, these days a lot of this uh, is done using DNA analysis. Um, the, the species is from the Ascoma seats that you may have heard of, are morels. Uh, they're a very good edible species that people find uh, in the springtime. Um, here we go. So we found a lot of these white saddles. Uh, places I've found them before tend to be in woodlands, uh, as you're seeing here, uh, and also under hedges. Uh, I found them under hedges quite a lot. So we've got a garden with a, a good, well-established hedge. Have a look under it at this time of year, and you might well find these. Uh, Helvellas. Uh, if I remember correctly, some of them are edible. Sorry, I'm just going to look up a book while I'm talking here. Uh, that's the great thing about doing it online. I can look things up. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So there are some edible ones. Um, I know I'm telling a fib. I'm telling a fib. It says edible but worthless. So there we go. Yeah, so there's a nice uh, shot of it. I maybe mention edibility a little bit more uh, while we're seeing something that's got a lot of footage. Um, basically, in terms of edibility, fungi range from deadly poisonous, things like death caps and destroying angels at one end of the spectrum, through to edible and excellent at the other end, like chanterelles, seps, field mushrooms, that kind of thing. Uh, but there's a range in the middle that are either slightly poisonous, inedible because they taste horrible, or they've got a woody or leathery structure, uh, to ones that you can eat but might taste a little bit iffy. Uh, and I think, looking at the book there, these Hovellas, they are edible but not, not worthwhile, which in my experience means they taste horrible. Uh, so probably best to avoid. Um, You've seen the sort of saddle-like structure quite nicely in that. Okay, so as I said, they, they grow uh, in woodland areas. And as we move through this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how fungi make their living, as it were. Uh, I mentioned the I mentioned the um, candle snuff living on dead wood. Um, Essentially, what you have to remember is fungi are not plants. Uh, they can't photosynthesize. So they can't produce their own food by using light, uh, carbon dioxide and water to create sugar. So they have to absorb nutrients from somewhere. And they have st three strategies really that they use for that. Uh, they either absorb it from dead tissue, so dead wood, um, decaying leaves, uh, dead animal bodies, uh, some of them specialise in faeces, uh, sort of cow pats, that kind of thing. So um, dead tissue. You also get some that live on live tissue. Uh, and we'll come back to them in a little while when we start talking about parasites. Anyway, I mentioned when I showed you that slide uh, with the ascoma seat and the basidium seat, the bottom of the cap has gills. Well, just to prove myself wrong, here's uh, an example of a fungi that doesn't have gills on the underside. Uh, and you'll see in a moment, uh, when we turn it over, that it's actually got a spongy layer on the bottom side of the cap. 
Uh, so it looks like a series of pores, but it fulfills exactly the same purpose as the gills on the, the mushrooms you buy in your supermarket. Uh, the spores are produced inside the pores. They fire off tiny little spines that stick out from the inside of the tube and drop down and blow away through gravity. Now this species is another woodland species. Uh, it's from a genus called Lexinum. Exactly what the species is I'm not sure because what you have to do to tell for sure is to peel back the cap and look at the cell structure which we, we didn't have the microscope to do. Uh, but there's that pore bearing surface that I talked about. Quite a few of these um, bleats, uh, that, that's generally what the, the whole group is called, are edible. Um, there's only one or two poisonous ones and as far as I know they're not being found in Scotland. Uh, this group, there's the orange birch boletus and the brown birch boletus, uh, which are both edible, uh, the orange one being better than the brown one. But there's also two or three other species that look very similar. Uh, so to be 100% sure, what you have to do is peel back the skin on the cap and have a look at that cell structure through a microscope to see if they're elongated cells or bulbous cells, and that's way more time than we've got. Uh, so we're not going to do that. So there's a, a considerable chunk of the basidiomycetes have got these pore bearing surfaces underneath. Um, uh, this genus of, of uh, beletes tend to specialise in woodlands, and what they do is, there's a photograph of a good one there, uh, what they do is the network of threads is actually the body of the fungi, that being the fruit body. As it spreads through the soil, it will wrap itself around the roots of uh, tree species. Uh, this is a, a little milk cap that I'll talk about in a minute, but it does the same thing. So that network of thread wraps itself around the roots of a tree penetrates within the roots and absorbs some of the sugar that the tree makes from photosynthesis. But it's not a parasite. The tree gains access to the network of threads that the, soil ha uh, that the fungi has in the soil and it allows it to absorb water and other nutrients, minerals, phosphates, that kind of thing from the soil. So it's actually a symbiosis. Uh, this one's a gray milk cap. Uh, and it specializes in living with birch trees. You can just see some birch leaves, or you could just below. The milk caps are quite a good uh, species, uh, group of species to get your eye in with because they produce this latex. I don't know if you can see it there, but there's a, like, a white droplet to the right hand upper edge of the cap. Um, we've actually got some good footage coming up in a minute. Uh, this is a different milk cap. I think that is probably curry scented mint ca uh, milk cap. Um, I was trying to key it out and I think that's what it came out as. So they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. The diagnostic feature is this milk, this latex that oozes from the flesh when it's damaged. Now that, that milky latex can be several colors. There's a good example there. The majority of them are white. So you can see that white liquid oozing out. Some of them are orange, red, uh, yellow, and some of them change color. Some of the milk changes color after it's been exposed to the air. Uh, you can see me there doing a taste test. Now this is something that I would recommend only doing once you've got your eye in with this group. But you can dab the milk onto the end of a finger put it in your mouth, um, absolutely certain that you've got a milk cap and nothing else. Uh, and what you're looking for is whether the flavor is mild, a spicy, chili pepper hot, bitter. Uh, there's a range of flavors and most textbooks will tell you what those flavors should be. And it gives you another clue towards the identification. Uh, now in a moment, you'll see me <laughs> discreetly turning and having a quick spit because you don't swallow this milk. Uh, you just dab it on your tongue, let it run about your tongue for a minute or two, and then spit it out. Now, what I'm pointing out there are the beech trees above us, uh, just because that's a, a very important factor as well in identifying what species you've got. 
So this particular milk cap is a different one. This is beach milk cap, sometimes called slimy beach milk cap because the cap is very slimy and it grows exclusively with beech trees. So if you see a, a fungi like this growing under a beech tree, you're almost certain that that's what it's going to be. Uh, so it's worth bearing in mind that if you're in woodlands, you need to do a good check of what tree species are around before you can identify fungi for certain. And this is the footage I was talking about where you can see that latex. It's forming a bigger and bigger drip and it's like watching paint dry, but it will drop off in a minute. <laughs> so again, you're, you're looking for clues to identification and things like how freely the milk flows may give you a, an indication. Some species produce copious amounts of milk like that one. Others just produce a little bit and no more. Okay. Um, so here we have yet another milk cap. We found quite a few species. I think we found about five or six. Uh, and this is woolly milk cap. Um, So-called because if you look closely, you can see how the cap's covered in a sort of woolly layer. Um, and a really good specimen that looks like it's covered in a sort of pink wool. And it lives specifically with birch trees. So we've got some footage there of an assortment of birch trees, probably silver birch. But, uh, and around the edge of the cap there is the best place to look for that wool. You can see the, when it focuses, you can see that woolly structure that I've been talking about. And the main thing to remember is it should be a sort of salmon pink colour in a good specimen. Uh, there are other, there's a fleecy milk cap, for instance, which is white, but has that same woolly structure. Uh, now, this species is slightly poisonous. Uh, certainly wouldn't recommend eating it. And again, you can see that milk starting to ooze out from... It usually comes out round about where the gills meet the cap. Uh, and there's a good illustration of the gills we were talking about earlier. So each of those little plates that you see under the cap there is lined with spores. Uh, just to give you an idea, a four inch cap. Sorry, I'm old. Uh, what's that? 10 centimetres, roughly. Somebody younger than me. Um, we'll have, if you say, imagine a cap that's about 10 centimetres in diameter, four inches in the old money. That's got approximately, very approximately, 16 million spores in it. And each of those spores is approximately uh, 10 microns across. Uh, so a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. 10 microns is about a hundredth of a millimeter. Uh, that's kind of an, an average across the whole range. So moving back to uh, species that live on dead wood, um, what you have here is a, a small sort of greyish coloured lump starting to stick out of the side of this beech twig. Uh, and this is a different way that fungi get their nutrients. This is a parasite. Uh, so this species is called porcelain fungi. You'll see why in a moment. Uh, and it infects beech trees. Uh, it probably won't kill the tree as a whole, but it might uh, infect and kill off quite sizable branches and cause them to drop off. So it can be a bit dangerous. Uh, as it gets bigger, it changes from that sort of greyish colour to white. Uh, and we should have some good shots of why it's called porcelain fungus coming up. Uh, it ends up about that sort of size you see there, so maybe two or three inches across, maybe slightly larger, pure white and very slimy on the top. Uh, the other name for it, the other English name used to be slippery beach tuft, because uh, the cap's very slippery. I think there's some footage from underneath coming up that shows you how they look translucent, almost like they're made of fine porcelain, hence the name. It's a good shot of how it's growing out of that wood. So the, the fungi itself is living inside that beech branch. The spores got into it through a crack in the bark where somebody's carved their initials or a twig snapped off. Uh, and it's working its way through that branch, slowly absorbing the nutrients it need. Unlike the, the symbiotic relationship we talked about earlier, it's, it's actually killing off that branch 
uh, over a period of time. Um, so there we go, some photographs of porcelain fungus. They are edible, uh, but because of the slime on the cap, it's a little bit more trouble than it's worth. Uh, my experience of slimy mushrooms, uh, ones that are naturally slimy when you collect them, is that if you try and eat them, they tend to be a bit too slimy for your gut. Uh, so it's it's a little bit uh, goes to, goes in one end and out the other. I'm afraid. <laughs> one way around that is to dry them off. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to preserve fungi. Uh, quite commonly, uh, people dry them by hanging them in either a dry, sunny windowsill or in specialist fungal dryers that you can buy or make yourself. Uh, and once they've been dried out, you can either keep them like that and rehydrate them with boiling water. I'm sure some of you have done that with uh, oh, some of the sets and things that you can buy in supermarkets. The other option is you put them into a mortar and pestle, grind them up and use the powder as a stock. Um, so that's, that's quite a common way some, some places do it. Uh, so let's just zoom in here. I've got notes as to what's next for the ones that are... <laughs> right, this is glistening ink cap, or it will be once you get a good shot of it. Um, there you go. So ink caps uh, get their name because they go through a process known as deliquescence. Uh, as they get older, the spores uh, and the cap start to turn into this black ink-like liquid, usually around the, around the lower edge of the cap and then start to drip off. And these are one of the things that our ancestors uh, started to use as ink, hence the name ink cap. Uh, they're called glistening ink cap, because if we get a good shot of one, you can see it's almost been sprinkled with talcum powder. Uh, they've got tiny little white freckles almost, uh, separate, separate particles on the surface of the cap, which if you get strong sunlight shining on it, it kind of glistens. And again, they're decomposing that dead, uh, that dead wood. Hello, Emma's playing with a video. <laughs> yeah, uh, you might just about be able to see it there somewhere. Anyway, glistening ink cap. So again, uh, with that, they, they are decomposing that dead branch. There's a branch underneath all that mo um, moss. Uh, and that's one way that fungi get their, um, get their nutrients. So anyway, uh, so I was referring to my notes here. This is one called a butter cap. Um, butter caps get their name because the cap is slightly greasy looking, but if you feel it, the top surface of the cap, it almost feels like it's been coated in butter. It's kind of slippery and greasy. Uh, and this is from a group uh, called the Tough Shanks because the, the stem of the fungi is really quite tough, usually. And this group specialises in decomposing leaf litter. So you see how it's growing on the floor of the woods. And all round about it, uh, there's a whole range of mostly birch leaves you can see there, uh, but there will be some other ones. Uh, and the network of threads that forms the, the body of the fungus itself uh, is basically growing underneath all of these leaves uh, that you see me pointing at there. Uh, and every so often they'll pop up a little fruit body. Um, so we've got another unconfirmed variety of Calibia there, uh, another tough shank. Uh, a good diagnostic feature for this group, if you can see the stem, the biggest one you've got there, just to the, just to the right of the image, uh, you can just about make out that there's a fairly obvious groove running the length of the stem. Uh, so this group generally have that sort of groove um, and quite tough shanks. And what I've done here is I've, I've carefully lifted one of these uh, mushrooms out of this the leaf litter. And you can see how there's a sort of yellow colouring that's holding all these leaves together. That's the actual fungal threads, the fungi body that these fruiting bodies are growing from. And they'll actually knit the leaves together as they grow through them. Uh, so if you get a good, uh, a good example, you can pick up dozens and dozens of these leaves, all sort of stitched together by fungal threads. 
uh, and then once they've absorbed enough, enough nutrients to produce those spores, they'll create a fertile uh, thing called a pseudothallus at the base of the stem that then opens up and forms these things that we call mushrooms and toadstools. Um, there's no real difference between the two. It used to be that the people thought toadstools or uh, poisonous mushrooms were edible. Anyway, here's another example of uh, some of these species that specialize on leaf litter, detritus on the woodland floor. Uh, this is a little one from a group called Marasmius. Um, so this is a, this is a collared Marasmius. Sometimes they're called horsehair fungi because quite often the stem that you see there is a sort of jet black color and looks like a horse's hair. Okay. I'm trying to remember the English name. I think the para, um, parachutes, so this is a collared parachute, I think is the new English name. Sorry, I'm, I'm so old, I just know the scientific names. <laughs> okay, what are we zooming in on here? Oh, here we go, there's a little cluster of them. Um, okay, so uh, these are leaf parachutes, uh, a little cluster of them so-called because they specialize on leaf litter again. And you can see how they all seem to be coming from one central point, but the actual body of the fungus is penetrating through various twigs and leaves and pine needles and so on in the, in the layer above. And what they're doing is they're breaking down the, the tissue of all those leaves and twigs. Um, and they're returning that, using it for their own benefit, obviously, in the first instance, uh, but they're returning those nutrients back to the soil. So they're, they're nature's woodland recyclers. Uh, and they're part of this great carbon cycle, uh, nitrogen cycle, all the rest of it, where they're returning nutrients that have been used by one organism back into the soil, ready for use by another. Uh, you can just about make out some of the black threads with that bottom triangle where the two twigs are joined. Those black threads are the actual body of that particular species. I would say that's Marasmius rotula. It's really hard to tell from a, a photograph, a video, should I say. Moving pictures. <laughs> okay, so once this one finally comes into view, there we are. Um, this should be, according to my notes, uh, a species called a brown roll rim. And it's another one of these uh, species that lives in a symbiotic relationship with trees. In this case, usually birch trees. So you need to identify the type of trees round about before you can be sure. Uh, it is poisonous. Um, it's also one of the ones that's got a cumulative effect. So it can actually build up in your body and it might not kill you the first few times you eat it, but as time goes by, uh, it builds up the toxins in your body. Uh, it looks like it's growing out of a log. They don't generally, they generally just grow out of the soil. Um, it may just be that the threads have grown around that log. Uh, they're called brown roll rims, and we'll see a, a piece of footage coming up shortly, uh, because the edge of the cap is curled round in on itself. So as it reaches the edge, as you're looking at it there, the edge kind of rolls round underneath uh, and almost touches itself back underneath under the gills. Um, here's another one that they, they really shouldn't be grown on logs like this, but uh, for some reason they were. Okay. Um, yeah, slightly unusual compared to some other species because normally what happens is they get formed, totally formed under the ground and the, the, the size of the mushroom expands as they pump water and expand cells. But that curled round lip uh, on the edge of the mushroom, uh, that's actually an active growing zone. So they, they do actually grow bigger as, as they get uh, throughout their life. And somebody once suggested that there's, there's no real upper limit to their size if they were left to a perfect environment. Um, the trouble is once once you start getting frosts coming along, they'll, they'll just die off. 
if we get a good shot of the underside in a minute. You can just about see on the left hand corner there where it curls round on itself. Um, the, the top of the cap kind of curling round underneath and doubling back on itself. Anyway, that's, that's the brown roll room. Um, so I'm going to have a look at some other parasites here. And most of the woods we were walking through were either beech or birch. Uh, and this is a whole load of, of birch trees. This is a really good example of why dead, dead wood, dead birch trees in this case, is very important. Uh, this is one called a, a birch polypore, uh, sometimes known as a razor strop fungus. Because if you get a good big specimen, people used to cut the, cut the surface in half. And just like the old leather razor strops that people sharpened cutthroat razors with in an old barber shop, you can use the leathery inside surface of those to kind of strop your razor. Uh, they'll, they'll get quite big. I've seen them almost a foot across uh, when they get full size. The other thing that they're used for is they, they cut very thin slices of it, almost like chamois leather. And because it's very absorbent, um, fishermen use it to dry their flies uh, when the flies get too wet when they're out fishing. Anyway, um, it's not the only species of uh, parasitic fungi that birch trees get. Uh, this is one called hoof fungus, sometimes called tinder fungus, because in the days before uh, good quality matches and cigarette lighters, People used to use flint and steel to, to make the fires. Uh, and one of the constituent parts of tinder uh, were the insides of this particular species. Uh, so they peel off the woody layer on the outside and grind up the inner uh, part to form a powder that takes a spark very readily. They'd mix it in with a few other chemicals like saltpeter. Uh, but it, it was the one of the things of choice to, to take a spark. Uh, apparently one of the things our ancestors used to do to move fire around. Making a fire without you know, modern help is quite difficult, so you don't do it unless you really have to. What they would do is they would put one of those brackets in the fire, start it smouldering, poke a hole through the other end of it, and you can carry one of those brackets for anything up to a day or two, if you get a big one, and it'll just smoulder away really slowly. And then when you get to another campsite, it's much easier just to blow on the, the glowing embers of it to start your next your next campfire. Now you can see what the, the, the fungi's done to this tree. Uh, in a moment, you'll see me starting to pull off bits and pieces of the, the wood that started to decay. Um, now that's really important because it allows invertebrates, things like slaters and wood boring beetles and so on, to access the nutrients that were locked up in that timber. Uh, so once the tree's dead, particularly when it's standing upright like that, it becomes a resource for a whole range of invertebrates. And that in turn becomes a resource for birds like woodpeckers uh, that specialize in catching all the little grubs and beetles and so on that are, are living on the dead wood. It also makes it very much easier to burrow into so if you're a woodpecker, you can excavate a, a hole in a piece of dead wood that's been softened by fungi far more easily than you can in a piece of solid oak. Um, so quite often you'll find these, these dead trees full of woodpecker burrows and also the, uh, the little holes where they've dug grubs out. Okay, so we've got another parasitic fungi here. Uh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the English name for it. Um, I can't, so I'm going to call it turkey tail. It is turkey tail. Yeah, these are turkey tail. Uh, but there's a mix of species here. So the one that you see just above that uh, is alder bracket. This is an alder tree. Uh, and it's got two stems coming off the same, uh, the same rootstock. And one of them was covered in these brackets. Uh, you can maybe just make out they've got a fairly distinctive sort of amber, almost honey coloured uh, resin that sort of oozes out the edge of the cap there. That's a good example there. Uh, so these are a parasite that specialises in alder trees. Uh, so it's a bit, a bit like the polypore we saw earlier and the, the tinder fungus. 
Uh, they've infected that, that branch. They're slowly decomposing it, making it available for other species to eat and to make nests in. Uh, and you can see the underside of the cap there, the spore bearing surface is again pore shaped. Uh, and some of these brackets are annual, pop out once a year, decay and drop off. Uh, and other than, others of them, like the tinder fungus, uh, are perennial, so you'll get almost like annual rings, zones, uh, growing out of the tree. Uh, but that's, that's a relatively easy one to identify. If you get an older tree and you see that sort of, those resinous droplets, honey-like droplets coming out the side. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good way of telling it. Uh, and it's an example of things have changed. Once upon a time, those were supposed to be rare. Uh, I remember when I started, uh, I my, my career in looking at fungi, and uh, that was considered to be quite a rare species, but time has moved on and it's become more and more common. And that's a phenomenon you get quite often in uh, groups of organisms that people are maybe not quite so interested in. Uh, so not like birds or deer or uh, other mammals, uh, things that are a bit challenging to identify. Very often the distribution is, is contained by who can actually identify them. Uh, so if, if nobody's able to tell what they are, they're not recorded. So they're put down as rare. So again, you can see that, uh, that twig going up there. What we're looking at here. Uh, this is another birch polypore, I think. I don't know why Amy didn't lump that one in with all the other birch polypores. <laughs> yes, it's another one of these brackets. That's, that's a young birch polypore. They start off looking like a, almost like a small white golf ball growing out the side of a birch tree. Uh, and as they expand, they get this sort of, I don't know what colour would you call that, sort of tawny brown, uh, almost like a skin forming on the surface that flakes. Um, and they will get quite big, but this, this species is annual, so uh, the fruit body that you're seeing there will live for one season and then drop off. But the network of threads that it has come from uh, still continues within that, uh, that branch that you can see just, to the, just above it. Here's a better example of the turkey tail we talked about earlier. A very common uh, decomposer. You'll find this on just about any tree stump that you come across in, in the woods. Uh, extremely common. Uh, we were discussing the naming of fungi earlier on before everybody joined. And this, this particular species uh, has something like 28 different scientific names. Uh, some going back as far as Linnaeus when he first started using the, the modern scientific naming process back in the 1700s. Uh, but they've been jumping from genus to genus for the last 250, 300 years. Now we're going to look at some of the smaller fungi now. Uh, these are from a group called the Mycena. And this one's sometimes called a nitrous bonnet. Uh, and it's called a bonnet because it looks like a bonnet. And nitrous because it's got a smell, a very distinctive smell of uh, sort of chlorine bleach. Uh, so it's, it's quite a difficult group to identify generally, but some of them will give you real good clues, like they've got a very strong scent, uh, or they, there's me smelling it just to prove it. So that one did smell sort of very bleachy. Um, so that was your... Mycena leptocephala, if you want the proper scientific name for it. This was one of the stars of the show, actually. This is down as being rare, but more common in Highland, Scotland. Uh, this is a relative of the chanterelle. Uh, this is called golden chanterelle. You can see how it's quite a golden colour. It's slightly different from the chanterelles you might buy in the shops. Uh, doesn't grow as big. Uh, the gills are slightly more pronounced and very vein-like, um, but the edge of the cap is almost circular, whereas a true chanterelle is very much more funnel-shaped, and the edge of the cap is much, much more irregular. Um, 
but that one's that one's golden chanterelle. There are actually at least three or four species of chanterelle. Uh, some of them are tastier than others. Um, the common chanterelle that you may have had in fancy restaurants, you can sometimes buy in supermarkets. Uh, that's the common one that people are familiar with and very good eating. Uh, but the golden chanterelles, as good if not better. Uh, you get another one that the French collect a lot called pied d'argent, uh, so ye yellow foot. Uh, and it has a sort of more brown coloured cap and a bright yellow uh, stem, so a yellow foot. Okay, now I think we're going to get a charcoal burner here. Yep, here we go. Now this group's called the brittle gills because the gills are quite brittle. Uh, if you sort of run your thumb over them, uh, they'll they'll split away and fracture very easily. Uh, and this one's called a charcoal burner. The brittle gills are actually quite a difficult group to identify. There's about 130 species in, in Britain, and some of them you need to use microscopes or chemical analysis to tell them apart. Uh, but these guys are reasonably easy to identify. They've got that sort of greeny purple cap that you saw earlier, uh, a sort of whitish yellowish gill, and they usually have a sort of fruity scent. Uh, so I'm hoping I'm going to turn it back over in a minute so you can see that sort of vinaceous it's called, that sort of purpley green colour on the cap. What I would say, there you go, that's, that's a fairly classic charcoal burner. The big white area you see this where a slug's been eating it. Um, now you shouldn't use that as an indication of edibility. Slugs will happily eat things that are deadly poisonous. Uh, so that, for instance, slugs have been munching their way through this. You can see all the damage around the edges. This is another species of brittle gill. And we found this growing under beech trees. Uh, it, grows, it grows exclusively with beech trees, so it has a very close relative that grows with pine. Uh, and you can just make out it's got a bright red cap. This is called a beech sickener, uh, and it will make you sick. Even a very small part of that in your mouth will make you throw up. Uh, and it was used in medicine, going back two, three, four hundred years plus, uh, when people used to use emetics to get the poison out of your body when they thought you had some sort of illness. So they would deliberately feed people things to make them sick. Uh, so rustlers are maybe a, a group I would leave to when you become a little bit more, uh, more advanced in your fungi identification. Now one point in that my finger there is a sort of an orange blob that's kind of squidging a sort of an orange milk. And you can see another one down there that I didn't burst. Uh, this isn't actually a fungus. This is a slime mold. Uh, it's called wolf's milk because people used to believe that lactating female wolves walking through the woods would drip milk onto the logs they jumped over. Uh, and it's got this sort of orange coloured, uh, it looks like latex. You, you can maybe just see to the, to the right of the the little ball, some of the orange colour on the moss. And those are the spores. Uh, can I just get you a pause that a minute, Emma? Just, uh, yeah, maybe go back just 30 seconds or so. Go back a little bit further, was it? Yeah, there we go. Can we get a sharp image on that? Yeah, so um, basically slime molds are a completely different group of, of organism. Um, and what they do is they, they make their living as single cell organisms rummaging about on the floor of the woods um, for most of their life, lifespan. And in that stage, what they're doing is eating bacteria. They, they feed uh, on bacteria. Um, and then when the, the conditions are right, all those little single cell organisms will come together and form a stream called a plasmodium that crawls across the woodland floor, uh, climbing over obstacles, through obstacles, until it finds somewhere where they get a little bit of elevation and the right combination of, of breezes and dampness so that they can reproduce. And at that stage, they form a, a fertile structure. Now, in this case, it's a sort of orange ball 
but in other species it can be a, a little ball on a stick or a little uh, club shaped uh, organism and inside that they'll, they'll reproduce and, and produce spores which are a little bit like a puff ball when they rupture will blow about in the wind and that's how they reproduce basically yeah so anyway wolf's milk yeah i am sad i find these things fascinating so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming near the end, so you can you can wake it up soon. Um, one of the stars of our particular visit, underneath some beech trees, were these little chaps. Uh, another mask of my seat. Uh, these are called, and you'll see why in a minute, jelly babies, um, because they look like they're made out of jellies. Um, looks like the sort of mushroom that you would get gills underneath the cap but they don't they just they're a bit like those silvellas those white saddles we saw earlier uh, they shoot spores out of the the upper surface there um, so that's that's a jelly baby uh, and you get them growing as i said exclusively with beech trees uh, but lovely little things and you usually find quite a lot of them once you do get them i'm basically trying to remember if they're edible mm -hmm. Hopefully I have a book that will tell me. It doesn't seem to say so, so, oh well. Anyway, moving swiftly on, uh, we've got one called um, a Lemon Disco is the new English name for it. As you can see how it's like small and disc shaped, hence the disco, and a sort of lemony colour. Um, the, the old scientific name for it was Bispirella citrina. So you can see how that citric yellow, that lemony yellow colour. Uh, and it's it's from a slightly different group. They're decomposing logs again. And then saving the best for last. Uh, I must say that I managed to bleed for this. So I hope you appreciate that. You can see those uh, bramble thorns there that managed to rip me open. These guys here that I'm pointing a stick at, because I've been cut by the bramble already, uh, are what they call devil's eggs. And you might be able to make out on the, the one to the top a sort of brownish jelly starting to ooze out of the surface. And you can see that one there, it's starting to split and this, this jelly starting to come out. And folklore had it that the devil rode through the woods on dark nights and laid eggs. Um, and the eggs would be foul smelling and would eventually hatch. Uh, and then what they hatched into is going to become obvious in a second or two i hope yeah so these these guys are uh, devil's eggs um they are edible at that stage but very few people eat them because as they get a little bit older they start stinking uh, they start smelling of rotten meat and they also start looking a little bit more um how shall we say it rude uh, so this is a stink horn uh, and as the egg hatches, uh, one of these emerges. And uh, this one's at a slightly later stage, where you see the flies on the end there. When they first emerge, that's covered with a, a dark greenish black mass of spores, and it stinks of dead, decomposing flesh. That attracts the flies in that you can see there, who eat the spores, buzz off into the woods. Uh, and spread spores around. So you can see how a combination of these jelly-like eggs hatching out the ground, the stink of the de of decay, decomposition, rotten meat, and the fact that they look yeah, phallic, there's no other word for it, uh, you can see why people associated them with the devil. Uh, in fact, on some estates, they used to send the gardeners around to knock them over with a stick before the, the gentry got a shock. Uh, but there we are, that's a phallus impudicus is the scientific name for a stink horn, which is always a good way to kind of end. Now the one you just shot uh, the one you just saw was I think Amy took some footage on a different day. Uh, we only got some very poor quality ones. But there's a nice photograph to end on. Okay, so that's taken just under an hour. Uh I'm going to have a drink of water while you think about whether you have any questions for me. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we've got, um, uh, I don't know where you found that stink horn, but we've got a, a model 
a model, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a, yeah. There's a model uh, Osprey yeah. nest, and every yeah, time right outside the back door of this yeah. year, of the semi year, uh -huh. we always find them. But I hadn't realised they'd come from those tiny little. Yeah. Sort of if you cut one of those eggs in half, uh, you'll see the actual, the shape of the stalk and the the head of. <laughs> how to say it politely. Um, mm -hmm. Within the sphere, and what happens is as as they become ripe. Um, they absorb water from the mycelium underneath and the stem elongates it basically the cells swell up the water right. and that causes it to grow and it will grow in real time as you watch it I remember having a very amusing minibus journey once where we took one back to a, a, a seminar and it actually grew as we <laughs> as we walked <laughs> which was slightly disconcerting <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that. No um, has anybody got any questions? You can put them in the chat and the Q and A, um, and Tony can see that as well, so he can answer them as you go. Uh, I can have a hit chat. Hang on, only a hit chat. Okay. Um, one of the things before while well, people are thinking about it is I quite often get asked good books. Um, generally speaking, this a whole range of books available, some of which are out of print, uh, some of which are based on photographs, uh, some of which are line drawings, and some of the more uh, esoteric texts have just got you know, words and you have to kind of just go by a description. Uh, anything really in the usual suspects, Collins, uh, RSPB guides, that kind of thing, uh, you can't really go wrong. Um, Normally, I mean, the Pocket Gem series, and, you know, the Collins Pocket Gem Guides, and they do them for all sorts of um, all sorts of species. But that was kind of my first fungi book, and it's only got about 150 species in it. Just to put that in context, there's something like 8,000 species in the UK alone. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's just the real common ones, the really easy to identify ones, but it's a good starting place. And then... That's that was the Bible for a while. I don't know. Can you see that? Mm. Roger um, Phillips. Yeah, Roger we've Phillips, got that one. Yeah, yeah this this is a, a later edition, not the first, the, the earlier editions. They're pretty good. Um, you know, they, they've got twelve hundred species, something like that, in it, and it's got all the common ones. Uh, they've got good oh, photographs. The good thing about the photographs is they're taken in in studio conditions. Mm. I've got some other uh, fungi books where they, uh, they use photographs, um, and they've taken um, they take the photographs in the field. The problem with that is, depending on the light conditions, how many slugs have eaten them, what good your camera is, you get very different images from one shot to another. So the good thing about the Phillips guides is they're taken under studio conditions with a, an assortment of specimens mm. that he's found. So you get, you know, the, the best uh, particular shot. So that's quite a good, quite a good book. Um, if you're looking for something for uh, things to eat, that's the one I've been recommending for a number of years. It's called the Edible Mushroom. It's actually called the Good Edible Mushroom. Oh, sorry, the Easy Edible Mushroom Guide by a chap called David Pegler et al. Um, and I don't know if this one's still in print. I've had it for a good few years. It's it specialises in edible fungi, mm -hmm. and just the reason I like it is let's let's find a, a decent one. Let's start from notepad, for instance. Uh, you've got a two-page spread. Uh, the first page on sorry this side uh, gives you the description and the, the drawings and so forth. There's a picture of the the specimen, but also you've got lookalikes. Uh, on the same two-page spread. And the reason this is quite a good example is woolly milk caps on there as a, a poisonous lookalike right. uh, for saffron milk cap. And it gives you how you tell them apart. The good thing about that is if you use any other, pretty much any other field guide, woolly milk cap and saffron milk cap will be on different pages in the book. Uh, so you've got to know what to look for to find out what the confusion species are. So that one's quite a good one. But there's lots of them out there and there's loads more stuff. There's loads of app thingies out there. Uh, there's even ones where you can take photographs of stuff and send it off and you'll get an expert send you back. 
uh, what they think it is. So there's, there's loads of, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Hazel, yeah, I've got a question from Hazel. She says, thank you. It um, has inspired me yeah. to do some fungi foraging. Well, Any tips for new beginners? Well, I think you probably covered that with the books, didn't you? Yeah. The other thing is if you're collecting for, for things to eat, what, I would, what I've always suggested is people go in and, and find one or two species that they're happy they know how to identify it. Um, just driving back to the house today, I saw a lot of shaggy ink caps out there. There seems to be a lot of shaggy ink caps around at the moment. Um, I'll try and find a picture of one of those as we talk. Um, they're fairly straightforward to identify. <laughs> he said, bearing in mind that he uh, used to think that about chanterelles. Um, there we go. Number six. Where are we? There we go. So there's your shaggy ink cap. I don't know how easily that's showing up. Is that? I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes called a lawyer's wig. Um, now, they're perfectly edible and a really good species when they are pure white. Uh, so that drawing is probably the best example there. Uh, so you see how there's no discoloration, unlike the photographs where they've started to turn black at the bottom. Right. So you get them while they're pure white. Uh, they're actually a really good one. Uh, a little bit delicate, so you don't cook them too much. Um, and the stems tend to be a little bit woody, but they're quite an easy one to identify. So pick one or two species you're happy with identifying. Try and learn some of the poisonous ones as well, uh, just so that you know what to avoid. Um, but you know that, that's kind of the way to the way to go. Um, go on proper walks, not virtual ones. <laughs> virtual ones are fine. This is the first one I've done. But, it's always um, handy. <laughs> yeah, um, but what I would suggest is there's no experience for actually getting out into the field. And on a normal walk, I would have passed those specimens around. And you get a chance to handle them, smell them, taste them. Uh, um, you know. Absolutely. Uh -huh. um, Alison's asking, what do you think of the apps you can download and it's supposed to give you an ID? I don't know. I've never used them. <laughs> um, I suspect okay, they're okay. Fair. I suspect they're okay. I, I tend not to use apps so much myself. I tried downloading the Roger Phillips app when it first came out and it crashed my phone. It basically took up my entire phone's memory for everything, and I couldn't make phone calls, couldn't do anything else. Now, they've probably improved since then. Phones certainly have. But I tend to use website links instead because you're not using up um, your phone's memory. Uh, and there's a couple of good ones. First Nature, I think it's called, and it's quite a good one. Um, Galway Wild Foods it specializes. It's a guy down in Dumfrieshire that specializes in um, foraging. Uh, and he's pretty good at putting up a lot of uh, poisonous and edible fungi species. Uh, yeah, the British Mycological Society, I should, I should sing their praises, having been a member for 30 odd years. Um, the British Mycological Society, they've got some good resources online as well. Um, and a, a real push, if you really want to know what something is, you can always send it to the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Uh, and somebody there will do some proper analysis on it for you um, and tell you what it is. They've got a, a basement full of voucher specimens for just about every species that's ever been found in Britain. Wow. Um, yeah. And one more question. Um, huh? Someone said, thank you. Um, and what are the regional variations for fungi in Scotland? <laughs> Um, it's more down to habitat, climate, and that sort of thing. Um, so I mentioned in the talk there that uh, some species are associated with one group of trees or another group of trees. So you get some that are associated with pine trees, some with birch trees, some with oak, beech, and so on. Uh, so you'll get variations from lowland Scotland where it tends to be predominantly oak, ash, elm, that kind of canopy type to upland Scotland where it tends to be more Scots pine, birch, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you'll get some some changes within that. You'll also get species that specialise, for instance, in sand dune habitats, in upland moorland, in grassland. 
Um, you know, so it, it really depends on the habitat. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as you go further and further north, uh, you, you get colder and colder winters, the same going up mountains as well. And one of the things that kind of knocks back the fruiting bodies to allow you to identify is winter, because once the frosts get them, that's when they tend to stop fruiting. Uh, although there's always an exception, an exception. There's, there's a species called a velvet shank that will actually freeze solid growing out the side of a tree. And then when, when it thaws the day, a day later, it's perfectly okay and will start spreading spores. Wow. Uh, whereas most mushrooms, you, you freeze them and they'll turn to mush. All the cells burst and they just, they, they go like raspberries when you freeze them. They go all mushy and horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Fortunately, oh. velvet, velvet shank is an edible species, so it's one you can freeze. <laughs> um, Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So the moral story is make sure you identify it properly. Um, yeah. Make sure you know the species of trees so the yes. habitat will help you identify if them. A, if it's a woodland species, because um, okay. there are grassland species, sand dune species, moorland species as well. Mm -hmm. But you need to look around and see what's with them. It, it's, it was once described to me as more of an art than a science. So you're kind of looking for clues uh, in the environment around about you. It's using all the senses. You might be smelling it. You might be tasting it. You might be looking for color variations. Um, some of them might have rough patches on the cap. You know, it's, it is using all the senses. Um, a good investment would be a hand lens or something like that to, to have a look for small structures, not microscopic structures, but certainly small structures. And if you get really into it, uh, I had a friend who used to get little you know, squirty Tipex bottles that he'd wash out and fill with different chemicals. So you could squirt those chemicals onto some species to see if there was any color change. Wow. And that's kind of more for your advanced. <laughs> yeah, that feels yeah. like a little bit too, too far ahead yeah, of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Oh, well, we don't seem to have any more questions. So um, okay. thank you very much for that presentation. No that was really problem at all. Very no interesting. Problem at all. Okay. Oh, wait a Someone's stuck no in the last second. Okay. Uh, it's always um, one. <laughs> Rachel says, we recently watched a TED Talk with Paul Stamets about turkey uh -huh. tail mushrooms, positive okay. effects of cancer treatments. What are your thoughts yeah. on medicinal purposes for mushrooms? Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of work on not just fungi, all, all sorts of plants uh, as well, uh, looking at uh, how they might be beneficial for a number of things. And I've heard turkey tails being used uh, as cancer treatment. So, yeah, I mean, that's uh, quite often our ancestors found cures or salves for things in the natural world that we're now actually finding and had some element of truth in them. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's, there's bound to be some sort of medicinal value. And the classic example would be aspirin. Uh, aspirin was originally found from meadowsweet, uh, the wildflower meadowsweet. Oh. And then uh, commercially it was first produced using willow bark and now it's manufactured in a laboratory and everybody uses aspirin. Yeah. So same thing, there must be other drugs out there, either in fungi or you know, flowering plants, trees, berries, whatever it might be. Uh, it's just a case of finding them, uh, trying to manufacture them so we can use them on the mass market. And it wouldn't just be cancer, it'd be, you know, heart medicine, anticoagulants, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, for everybody that has joined or anyone that's not joined, um, we will um, be putting this recording up on the Scottish Wildlife Trust um, YouTube channel once it's been edited down for all our chat at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you very much, Tony. Um, that's okay. Fantastic. And I will chuck everybody out. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully next year we'll be live in person and knocking the lows. I think that's a great idea. Thank you very much. No problem.